Welcome. Today's a special day. We get to see uh, two people get baptized. And it's such a wonderful day to uh, see that and have the, uh, to see the symbolism of being dead of your old self to being renewed for in a new, a new creation in Christ Jesus. So let us bless his name. Let us stand up and praise his name for he is almighty and he is good and his love endures forever. Amen. Join us in prayer this morning. Let's start out just giving glory to God. Father, we come before you with gratitude, thanksgiving upon our heart for the goodness and the glory and the wonder of our God. We love you, Lord, with all our heart. And I pray that, Lord, you are here. We know what your word says. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And, God, we rejoice in you and the liberty that you have given us and the freedom And know that your spirit is here to move among us. Give us open hearts and open ears and open eyes. Lord, to see, hear, and be moved by what it is you desire out of our life today. Thank you for these moments. Thank you, Lord, for these two that will walk through the baptismal waters this morning. To you be glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. God bless you. Be seated. I want to welcome everybody this morning and say how day, how day, how day. It is good to have you all here. And it is a special morning. I usually don't preach or teach from back here, but I will today because we get to uh, uh, rejoice with two that are going to walk through the baptismal waters. Uh, just for those of you that are visiting, we want to welcome you and say it's so good to have you here with us. And I owe an apology to, to Linda. I lied to Linda. I didn't intentionally lie to Linda, but I did. I told her not to worry. The water will be warm this morning. Gentlemen, we need to check the heater on the pump because the water ain't as warm as I thought it was going to be. In fact, it's a little, well, it, it's comfortable, but it's not warm. So either the dial got turned down and didn't know it, it's not cold, cold, but it's cool, cool. <laughs> Whoops. That's okay. Uh, Cody knew what it was to get cold, didn't you? Yeah, because I forgot to fill it that Friday, and I filled it that Sunday morning, hauling buckets in and throwing it in, and it was plenty cool. But then I baptized in rivers and Lake Tahoe and all kinds of cold water, so it's good to be here. Baptism, one of the two ordinances that God has given us, that of the Lord's Supper. Baptism is, is precious because of the picture that it draws for us. It is a physical illustration that you and I can see. Jesus walked about uh, 30, 40 miles to meet with John in the wilderness to be baptized by him. Uh, didn't, you know, some people say, well, that washes the sin away. Well, Jesus didn't have any sin to wash away since he was the perfect lamb of God, since he was the son of God, 100% man, 100% God. No for Jesus, there's, there's a much, much deeper lesson for us. Remember, Jesus came to die in our place. He came to be our representative upon the cross. And when he walked down those waters, he's identifying. It's identification. He's identifying with us, with sinful man. But he's doing something else. He's preaching a wonderful lesson that they're going to see unfold in another three-plus years. He's going to teach the fact that the Son of Man must die and be buried. As the scripture says, Paul said, but not to worry because after three days they might tear that house down, but he would rise again, as the scripture says. And that's the simple gospel that Paul proclaimed and gives to us in First, uh, uh, first Corinthians chapter 15, uh, when he says, uh, I delivered to you what was first delivered to me, that Christ died for our sins according to scripture, was buried and rose on the third day according to scripture. But he didn't leave it there. He came up out of the water and he came up. Some, some people say, well, do you sprinkle? We don't sprinkle. We immerse. Because the word baptismo in the Greek means to come up from under. It means to immerse. So baptism is by immersion because nothing else pictures burial quite like it. If somebody died, you wouldn't take them out in the field and just dust a little dirt over them. No, you'd bury them. So it pictures burial. It pictures resurrection. And Jesus is saying in that simple message, I will die, but I will raise again, as he identifies with us. Now, when we come into these waters, because he left us this great command, go into the world, make disciples of all nations, teaching them all that I've taught you, and baptize, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I taught you. And then, of course, that great promise, I'll be with you to the end of the age. Watch people, bring people to relationship with Christ. Then let them declare that relationship through baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then disciple them, equip them, teach them. What a great commission God's given to the church. So when somebody walks into the baptismal waters today, it's also identificational. They're identifying with Christ, what he's done in their heart and life already. And they're painting that great picture that that old man is dead was buried, but they rose to walk in a newness of life. They're identifying with him, and they're identifying with the body of Christ. What a testimony. What a witness. And we get to participate. Father, I ask you to bless these moments and bless, Lord, what happens in this simple, wonderful sermon preached by those who testify the grace of God and demonstrate that, or that grace represented in the death, burial, and resurrection of the old life.
God be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen. Linda? <laughs> you may not have heard that. She says, oh, you're right. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> really cold. That's okay. She was confessional with me earlier. Oh. She says, I'm afraid of water. So I, I told her, I haven't lost one yet, so we're not going to lose one now, all right? all right? However, I did tell Cody I wouldn't hold him down more than five minutes. So, you know, <laughs> in all honesty. No, you won't be down there five minutes. <laughs> no, 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 Linda. I'm not going to do that to you, all right? Linda, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, I have. You know him as Lord of your life? Yes. And uh, you're here to declare that to everybody through this demonstration of baptism? Yes. All right. Thank Father, I thank you for Linda. I thank you, Lord, for the grace that has been shown her. I thank you for the rich, wonderful, sweet, delicate spirit that is within her. And I thank you, Lord, the moment she received you, your spirit flooded into her. And God, here she is testifying of that grace to all. May you be glorified, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You hold your nose. I, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likenesses of death, raised to walk in a newness of life. And everybody said? Amen. All right. We did it. Thank you. Uh -huh. Emmanuel, I got to tell you, I, I get excited getting to baptize Emmanuel. I baptized his wife and his three wonderful children back on March 15, 2020. Go ahead and take a seat here. Not too long ago, you and I knelt at that front row of chairs, and you prayed to receive Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior in your life. Is that true? He has saved you. You are born again, and you're going to live your life for him, right? Oh, God, I thank you. I thank you for Emmanuel. I thank you for his family. I thank you for the witness and the testimony of the Spirit of God within him. I thank you for all you have brought him through, Lord, through his surgery and all of that. All of it, Lord, just to bring him to that wonderful tender moment here in this room where life flooded into him. And he passed from death in the old man to life in Christ. God, I thank you, and I praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Emmanuel, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in a newness of life. And everybody said? Yeah. All right. Woo! I think we ought to go on a little bit more. Anybody want to join me up here? Welcome to. Let's continue praising our God. Oh, what a wonderful, a wonderful scene, amen. <laughs> I just want to, I want to say a little bit about this song is uh, um, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Um, oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that has life and breath come now with praises before him. You know, it's just, it's just easy to um, overlook all the things that he has created and, and think, oh, um, you know, like we take it for granted all the things that God has for us, right? And... Being able to see all that he has done, all the creation, we can just point it back to him. That is just a wonderful thing. Like everywhere we look, we'll, it all points back to him. So let us praise him, this, this hymn as praise to the Lord, the Almighty. to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my 
my soul praise him for he is your health and salvation hum all who hear now to his temple draw near join me in glad adoration Grace to the Lord above all things so wondrously reigning. Shelters thee under his wings and so gently sustaining. Have you not seen all that is needful has been sent by his gracious ordaining? Grace to the Lord, oh, let all that is in me adore him. All that has life and breath come thou with praises before him. Let the amen sound from his people again, gladly forever adore. Sound from his people again, gladly forever Step down into darkness, open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. But here I am to worship here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, 
Thank you for everything that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. Giving us the gift of salvation, Lord. Giving us the hope that we so desperately need. Lord, you didn't do this because we earned it, Lord, but because you loved us. Lord, help us to recognize that. Recognize that you, that you love us regardless of who we are. Lord, Lord, help us to uh, help remind others as well of this, because you, Lord, have loved all of us, the world, in giving your son for each and every one of us, Lord. Lord, in this song, I Surrender All, is, it's, uh, it's a prayer, Lord, that we give up everything that we have. We give up our lives to you, Lord. 
Help us to do that and help us to love others um, as you have loved us in that way, Lord. Thank you. Help us to open our hearts and ears for the message, Lord, and be with the pastor as he's going to teach us about um, more about you, Lord. Help us to apply these to our lives, Lord. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Isaac. All right. Get my little thing here. Moved it off so y'all could see what was going on behind it. That's fun. That's fun. I love that. I just have, I have such a good time. I have better time than anybody. It, it's fun. By the way, the next cell up here is that of a young man. And uh, he's not here. I think he had too much party after his graduation last night. Yeah, I don't know, but go, go ahead and roll that. You know, let's go ahead and, there we go. See that nice looking young gentleman between his two parents? Uh, Willola and Emmanuel. Emmanuel, you saw up there. Willola's back there. I was going to have him stand up, but he's not here to, to embarrass him. So I'll let mom and dad stand up in his stead. Joseph graduated <laughs> high school. And you give him our love and our excitement at that challenge <sighs> hurdled. I don't know. I was going to ask you to tell everybody what his plans were. But uh, we'll get to that at another time. God bless. Uh, so remember him in your prayer. You get a chance, maybe drop him a card. Uh, he lives with his folks there. Their, their address and everything is in the directory. Drop him a card and say, congratulations. I got a phone call or a text message saying, we're having a graduation party. Joseph graduated. Then they postponed it because we had the shower yesterday. And, and then after the shower, there was the graduation party. And I got over there to drop by real quick uh, because I had several other things going on that night and got over there and here's Rosa peeling plantains you know uh, you know I bet they were good I'll see her. I bet they were good they're gonna have fried plantains as part of it oh they are good Woo. all right hey anyway, right we're here this morning I'd like you to open your Bibles to Romans in chapter 6 because that's where we're coming from as we talk about being dead to sin and alive to God probably uh, there's there's uh, simply no uh, greater pressing practical issue, I think, in our lives day to day for every one of us is how to gain victory over temptation and sin uh, that you and I encounter every day. In fact, if you don't, I want to hear from you because I want to know what your secret is or where you're living that you don't encounter both uh, temptation and, 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 and sin every day as believers. Uh, the joy is, and the great good news is, the bondage of sin has been broken. And you have been set free from the power of sin's enslavement. In fact, when Paul writes uh, to Rome, to the Roman church, and he gets the sixth chapter, he says in the sixth verse, he says that, old, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. God, I want to thank you for that. I thank you, Lord, for that word lifted up out of Scripture. I thank you for this whole section, Lord, that is just filled with the victory that you've given. And my responsibility under the leadership and power of the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you. Now bless us, Lord, today. Let us hear you clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if it's a case that we struggle with this kind of thing, is there an answer? And does Scripture provide us one? And... Uh, you know, what has God done uh, uh, to make possible for us no longer to be enslaved to sin? Now, I want a reality check here for everybody, if you will. Uh, we are not enslaved to sin, but that does not mean that we attain in this life sinless perfection. Uh, I know that, that we would like that, and I know there are some that, that teach that, but I have not yet met a saint. I've known some pretty saintly people that had reached that state of absolute perfection. We won't uh, until one, uh, he comes back and gathers us together with him and we have these new glorified resurrected bodies or two, I just simply give it up here for to be absent in this body is to be present with the Lord and in his presence there is uh, no sin. Uh, Paul uh, 
has been clearly uh, teaching us, and when we get to verse 6, that we can grow spiritually to such a degree that we, can, that we no longer continue to allow sin to be a habitual visitor in our home. He may come, he may raise up that ugly head at times, but you see, I, I don't think that we can uh, uh, enjoy it or uh, revel in it like we did before Christ. I wish I could assure everyone that the day would come that eventually, uh, during the course of this life, we would no longer sin, but I can't. But what I can assure you is that God's empowering grace and because we have identified with Jesus so completely and through the indwelling of the presence of the Holy Spirit, we no longer need to experience the sin's exertion, its enslaving, its governing authority over our lives. And my friends, that's not just good news, that's very good news. So, where does Paul begin? Where does he start with this, uh, uh, with this whole thing? The apostle says that the pathway to victory over sin begins somewhere. And I believe that, that what he's showing us, it begins with our understanding of who we are in Christ, that great identification, and what it is that he has done in us, what he has provided for us for our victory. So I, I guess I want to start maybe where Paul starts. I think that's a good idea. I mean, if I'm going to, you know, I might as well start where he started, you know, don't you think? All right, he starts here. You, you and I both have a brand new, a whole new provision in our life. If you're a believer, if you've come to faith in Christ, you have a whole new provision that you didn't have before. Before Christ came into our life, Paul tells us that we were powerless, does he not, in that fifth chapter, to do anything about our condition? We were hopeless. We were powerless to change. But at the right time, Christ died even for the ungodly, it says. So we were powerless, but... Uh, when we came to faith in Christ, uh, when we bowed a heart and life to him, we were given a resource that is far greater uh, than sin that exerted its authority in our life for so long. In Romans chapter 5 and verses 20 through 21, you know, because it all kind of bleeds in together here. By the way, i tell you what I tell the guys in, in uh, Bible study nearly every day. Chapter and verse men put in there as they interpret the word to make it easy for us to navigate. Paul did not write in chapter and verse. We kind of you know, go from the end of chapter 5 and the thought continues all the way into chapter 6. He says this, the law came in so that transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Where there's sin, sin super abundantly abounds much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace, I want to underline that. You're going to hear a lot about that word today. Grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Grace, grace, God's, I love that song. But they're not like a whole lot of them. Grace is God's great provision for the life of the believer. The flood of grace, oh my friends, surpasses the flood of sin, the trickle of sin in comparison. Great as that sin might be or is. You see, the Christian life begins by grace. You and I would know nothing of God if it were not for grace. We wouldn't have the ability nor the inclination to know him apart from grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. What can you add to grace? Big goose egg. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Grace is a gift. Faith is a gift. Salvation is a gift. Not as a result of works. So that no one may boast. 
You see, his whole life begins at the altar of grace. We have standing before God. We have been pronounced acquitted, set free, forgiven. Does it get any better than that? Well, think about it. The Christian life is sustained by grace. I stay in this wonderful relationship not because of anything that I can do, but because of what God did. When God made, he gives a perfect illustration when Paul is writing to the church in Galatia and he's talking to them in the third chapter. He uses the illustration of Abraham and the covenant. Remember that? It said God entered into a covenant with Abraham and his seed. I say seed, not seeds as in many, but seed as in one, and that's Jesus Christ. In other words, that covenant that God entered into, that he brings over and likens to the covenant that we entered into, Abraham entered into a covenant between God and the seed, Jesus Christ. You see, God, part of the first part, makes his blood oath, this covenant between Abraham and Jesus, co-parties of the second part. Did, Adam, did, did Abraham ever break the covenant? Well, read a few verses down from where, where it says that, and you'll find out that uh, he lied about who his wife was, you know, for one. He, he did a whole lot of stuff, folks. He, he, had a, he had a child he shouldn't have had in Ishmael because God didn't tell him to do it that way. So, yeah, he broke the covenant. So why does Abraham, the father of faith, why? Because Jesus, co-party the second part, he doesn't know how to break a covenant, can't. He's God. Right? So who keeps the covenant for Abraham? Jesus. Makes sense. Those of you that are born again, those of you who are saved, you entered into a covenant with God. You saw some of that being played out up here this morning, right? But it wasn't covenant with God. God, part of the first part, he gives you full, absolute forgiveness of sin. Anybody sinned since they got saved? Then why are you still saved? Grace. Uh, grace thank you. Yeah. You see, uh, God made a covenant with you. Uh, God, part of the first part, Mike Ruptak and Jesus Christ, co-parties of the second part. Now, guess what? Mike broke the covenant a whole lot. So who keeps the covenant for Mike? Jesus. I just love the word of God. It's so much fun. Truth is wonderful. Paul says in Galatians 2 and 20 through 21, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. In saying this, he says, I do not nullify grace, people, for if righteousness comes through the law, in other words, if, if, if I can do all kinds of good things to get righteous, then, then, then I have absolutely nullified the death of Christ. He died needlessly. In other words, friends, if, if, if you could work to righteousness, why did he go to the cross? Doesn't make sense, does it? But since we can't work to righteousness, it makes all the sense of the world. Because Paul goes on, again, forget chapter and break, go right on to that third chapter. And the first, uh, first few verses, the third, two and three, it says, This is only the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Did it come by faith, grace by faith? You know, how did it come? How did you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? How do you receive salvation? By grace, through faith. And then he goes on to say, uh, are you so foolish that having begun by the Spirit, you're now being perfected by the flesh? <laughs> you see, it's grace that carries us through. It's grace that promises he who has begun a good work in you will complete it, perfect it until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take it to the bank. Rest on grace. Live on grace. Stand on grace. It's all about grace, my friends. But through grace, the believer died to sin. The old man's a dead man. Dead, buried, and, 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 and taken out of the way. Slip right back into Romans 6, verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may increase? Remember, he says, where sin abounded, grace does much more abound. Shall we then continue in sin that grace would increase all the more? <laughs> then he said, Stop it, stupid. Well, 
That's a Mike paraphrase. You understand? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin, the dominion that sin had over us, live any longer under that dominion? <laughs> you see, because of the abundant grace that has been poured out in the life of the believer, we are no longer to live habitually in a life of increasing sin. There is a heresy that began a whole lot longer than, than, than any of us have been around that said, uh, well, since grace or sin bounds, grace much more bounds. Way back in about the second, third century, uh, there were these folks that come along and said, well, if that's the case, then go out and live it up. Sin all you want to sin because that's the way you get more and more grace. You're going, ha! Ah, it's a true, it's, 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 it's part of what some of the early church councils kind of dealt with. But I've got to tell you, that's the same thing that goes on today. People walk an aisle, they say a few words, they may even get wet, and then they go out and live like the devil, thinking that grace, no, if that's your thought pattern, you probably never got saved to begin with. God doesn't say the Christian won't sin, just says you're not going to like it when you do. You're not going to stay in that condition. Folks, I, we had pigs when I was a kid. There were occasions that I fell in a hog pen. Right there with all the stuff that hogs leave by and what they eat. And I got up not smelling good, but you know what? I didn't stay that way. I went and got in the 303 tub and scrubbed off as quick as I could. My mom's out on a washing board scrubbing my clothes so they didn't smell like pig. No, Christian, you may sin, but you're not going to wallow in it. You're not going to stay there. You may fall down today. You may get money today, but give me tomorrow. Be back up and cleaned up. Abundant grace. If saved, you acknowledge the reality of sin, but you're never satisfied in it. Second thing I want you to see that we have, we have a whole new position in life. We watch that played out in, 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 in real time, a kind of role play out here. We are immersed in Christ Jesus. Our position in Christ is beautifully illustrated by what we have witnessed and what we have seen twice this morning. Look at verses 3 through 7 in that 6th chapter. Oh, do you not know all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism unto death so that as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. That our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin for he who has died is freed from sin. Now I'm going to give you a, a, a little lesson I, I guess that, that is burning on my heart and have been for a bit. Those of you that by the when you came to faith in Christ, by, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, you were immersed in him, just like the, those in the upper room in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, they were immersed in the element of the Holy Spirit, never to leave. Listen, when you walk into these waters, you are immersed in an element that, that is foreign to you, but you come up out of that because you couldn't breathe underwater. But you never see the Holy Spirit withdrawing from the church after the day of Pentecost. It doesn't happen. And every one of you that are born again, every one of you that are saved, it's as if you walked into that immersion of the Holy Spirit. He is in you, around you. You are immersed. He put you in Christ Jesus. That's what's pictured here. Baptism is a symbol, an ordinance. It doesn't save. It's representative of something, Yes. Through the picture portrayed through baptism, we, we call to mind Christ and what he did for us. It helps us understand our new identification in him. As he identified with me at baptism and on the cross, I now identify with him in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 
When the believer descends into that water and the water closes over his head, it's like being buried when you die. When you come up out of that water, I was sharing with Linda, you know, back there, I, she, she said, I'm a, my husband said, I probably, I'll tell you, I'm afraid of water. And that's okay. I told her a story about a little eight-year-old girl, first church. Daddy was a deacon, little spindly little gal. I mean, not bigger than my fingernail. And I took her in that baptismal water, and I, I, I let her down, and she came out of that water like a Triton missile. <laughs> she climbed right up me. She wrapped her hands and legs around my body with her body here. <laughs> I had to get two men help me out of the baptistry to peel that eight-year-old girl off of me. She was afraid of water. Her daddy's laughing. He's rolling over in the baptistry room up there, having a real hearty chuckle. All oh, the stories I could tell. Come up out of that water. It's just as representative of being raised up. Seated with him. Whatever happened to Jesus happened to us. The believer of the Lord Jesus Christ is saying he died to one kind of life and rose to an entirely different kind of life. He died to the old self, the old life of sin, and he's been risen into the new life of Christ. He has a new ruler, a whole new dominion over him. Baptism is a public testimony, a public proclamation of a believer's new inward relationship with Jesus Christ. Now people, that inward union takes place before the act of baptism. I make an emphasis. I make this distinction because there is a false teaching out there that I believe is critically dangerous and undermines the grace of God and diminishes the very blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sin. And that false teaching is simply this, that it is, faith is not sufficient in itself. Grace is not sufficient in itself to bring about salvation and to produce justification. So we need to add something to it. And what we add to it is baptism, or several other things that could be added to it. In other words, it is faith plus baptism, place plus something else, place faith plus all of our good works that saves. I'm going to say it very plainly, this heresy rests largely on only two or three verses of Scripture, this being one that we're looking at, but probably the primary verse that it rests its, its weight upon was found over in 1 Peter in chapter 3. If you, it'll be up there. If you want to mark it in your Bible, you can look at it because it is literally the only place in the Bible that says baptism saves. The only place. But listen to this. For Christ, in verse 18, chapter 3, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison below. By the way, don't ask me. I don't understand that one hardly at all. Who once were disobedient, where the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, and in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. you say, well, that's pretty plain, preacher. He goes on to say, not the removal of dirt from the flesh but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. Now, my friends, here's the danger when crafty people skillfully twist Scripture and take things out of context and refuse to look at the language. They say, see there, it's there in black and white. You can see it for yourself. Baptism now saves you. And since Noah was saved through the water, that proves baptism now saves you. And don't tell me that that's not the logic that is appealed because I've been dealing with it now for, for, for 40 some years, but just recently. Head on. But to rightly understand it, we need to look at the context. And in the context to rightly handling the word of truth, we need to see what 
hinge this all rests upon. It rests upon that, that little, little term in verse 21. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. The key word, and you write this down if you want to, the key word in that whole section is the word corresponding. Antitupin is the Greek word. Antitupin. And it simply means a copy, a type, corresponding to, resembling another, representing of something. So then, the logical question comes in, what does then bapti baptism represent? To what does baptism correspond? Is it the flood waters? To so was saved through the flood, through the waters. Or is it the ark? I'm not going to ask you to answer the question. I'm going to give it to you. Noah wasn't saved through the water. He was saved because he's in the ark. Right? What would have happened to Noah if he wasn't in the ark? Couldn't very easily pass through the waters then, could he? No, he was in the ark. And the ark was on the water. Better place to be. So, what did the flood waters represent? Think about it. If you got the answer, I'll, I'll give it to you. Flood represented judgment. It represented the pouring of God's wrath out upon the wickedness of the world. Genesis 6, verse 13, and then I'll take a verse out of, uh, out of 7, uh, verse 4. It says, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of men, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will blot out from the earth uh, from the face of the land, every living thing that I have made. Floodwaters is a type of God's judgment upon sin. The ark, in typography, in, in, in looking at types, is a type of Christ who alone saves man from the outpouring of the wrath of God. The only thing that protects those of you that are born again from the wrath of God is the fact that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for your sin and you are now in him. Genesis 7 tells us that Noah and his family and every living thing came into the ark by twos, male and female, and the rest of his family, and, and, and according, they came in according to the word of God. And then it says what? Who shut the door to the ark? Jehovah. God shut the door to the ark. Noah couldn't shut the door. God did. He was incapable, powerless to do anything about his condition. So God shut the door. So how did Noah and his family get in the ark? And how were they saved from the wrath of God being poured out upon ungodly man? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us that. Hebrews 11, verse 7, it says that Noah built an ark out of obedience and entered the ark by faith. Listen to this. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness, which is according to works or faith. The flood waters destroyed the ungodly, but Noah and his family were saved because they were in the ark. And though the ungodly got destroyed, the righteous were saved by faith. Peter consistently, and I, I know I'm, I'm right on target because uh, Peter elsewhere in, in 2 Peter refers to the flood waters as a means of destruction of the ungodly, not the salvation of Noah and his family. Rather, it was the ark that saved, the ark that Noah and his family entered into by faith. Noah saved from entering these flood waters and divine wrath by entering into the ark by faith. Noah and his family 
were brought safely through the judgment because they were in Christ. They were in the ark. And my friends, if you're going to escape the judgment that will come upon this earth one day, if you and I are living when Jesus comes back and judgment is poured upon the earth, you will be saved only because you're in Christ. And if I were to, if you were to die today without Christ and you had faith, there is assurance that there will be judgment. There, after death, there is judgment. The only way to escape the certain judgment of God is get in Christ. The only way you can do that is by faith. Paul opens this whole section in, in, in Romans chapter 6, or 5, 1. He says this. He says, we are justified by faith. Not justified by faith plus anything. In conduct, in context, and all the way through the harmony of the scripture. It would seem to me that baptism refers uh, to the ark, which is symbolic of being in Christ. Not the waters, which may be why the rest of that verse says, not the removal of dirt from the body, but a pledge of a good conscience. And of course, that's exactly, if you go back up to that section when I read in full, Paul begins there, that you and I would stand before a lost world with a good conscience. How do you do it? By faith alone. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So, just like Noah and his family were inside the ark, whatever happened to the ark happened to everybody that was inside the ark. So when by faith you surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you find that you are in Him, this whole section is riddled with being in Him and with Him. So what happened to Him happened to you. Now I want to play this whole picture out just a little bit further. When Jesus hung upon the cross paying for your sin, my old sin nature, my old man found himself in Christ hanging with Him as he took the punishment for my sin, as God judged my sin in Christ, my old man was judged in Christ. When Christ was buried, my old man was buried with Christ in that tomb. When Jesus rose from the grave three days later, it was the new man, the new me, that rose up to walk in a newness of life. What happened? Our identity changed when we came to Christ. When we believed on Christ as our Savior and received eternal life, we were immersed into His death and His resurrection. And our identity changed. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ. He is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. I am a new man. That old man died years ago. Oh, he likes to stand up and shake a fist occasionally. Frequently. But I can look him in the eye and say, you're dead. I'm no longer under your authority. Christ's death to sin became our death to sin. His burial became our burial. His resurrection became our resurrection. We have a whole new identity. We now have become permanently and eternally united with Christ. And that's very, very good news. We don't any longer identify with Adam's race. We identify with Christ and his family. Third, we have a new power. By power, I mean that we have a new governing authority over our life. We have a new management. 
Look at verses 8 and 9. Now, if you have died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For death that he, for the death that he died, he died uh, to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God. Jesus Christ died, yes. That's a historical fact, a point in time. There was a day in time and space that Jesus died. It'll never be repeated again. And moreover, we are in him. And that, my friends, is the sanctified life. I'm in the process of, of I've been delivered from the penalty of sin. I'm in this life in the process of being delivered from the power that sin extorted over me. One day, I'll be, be delivered from the very presence of sin. But right now, my life is in the sanctifying process. Paul wrote this whole argument revolving around our intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he gives us the picture of our master and our Lord. And since he was raised from the dead, he will never die again. For death no longer is master over him. Sin brings death. So sin is no longer our master. Sin and death has been conquered. By the way, our old landlord, sin and death, no longer has any right to the property. He doesn't. He doesn't have any right to you any longer. There's a new owner. We are no longer have any obligation to the old management. We are only to obey the new management. And that's Christ. So what do you need to do first? Consider your new position. Consider it. Verse 11. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting your members of your body uh, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall no longer master over you, for you are not under the law, but under, what's that word? Grace. Now, what do we do to these great truths? Well, my friends, I think you need to learn how to rehearse them. I, I think you need to count upon the fact that you've received his spiritual life and do it on a daily basis. Paul says, consider, reckon it so. Count on it. Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to Jesus. Let your mind play on those kind of truths. Meditate on them. Keep saying them to yourself. Remind yourself of who you are in Christ. Constantly counting on the fact that you are dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Listen, this secret of living a holy life is simply this. Set your mind on Christ. Paul says to the church in Colossae, set your mind above where, where, where he's seated at the right hand of God, not on things below. Set your mind on Christ. And here are the facts that you need to repeat to yourself. Christ paid your penalty for your sin. Christ set you free. Uh, he he, he, he uh, he lives in you. You are called to walk in a newness of life. You're dead to sin, alive to God. You're free. Live free. Don't subject yourself to sin. Secondly, choose absolute surrender. Not to walk around like this. I give up. That's the universal sign of surrender, by the way. You know, somebody point a gun at you, what you going to do? That's absolute sign of surrender. Therefore, let sin not reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Do not go on presenting your members of your body as instruments of unrighteousness. Rather, present yourself to God as those alive from, uh, from, from, from death and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall no longer be master over you, for you are not under, under the law, but under grace. Notice the therefore. 
based on everything that I have said, based on God's grace, based on your new identity, based upon the new management, then do not let sin reign. Rule, govern over you. You've been raised up with Christ, you've been set free, then live for him. Do not let sin continue to, deme- to, be, uh, to, to, to reign. Sin does not have to be the king of your life. You do not have to obey it any longer. It is no longer your master. The reign of sin is over. Paul adds to that, present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. The Apostle Paul calls us to a wholehearted and total surrender to Christ. Do not go on keeping, presenting your members to sin, but go on, going on, continually presenting yourselves to God. I met a man one time who spent many years in the military. And uh, he never made large rank. Just about everybody that he knew was over him. And anybody been in the military? When you're walking down, you know, on base and you're walking down, you got your uniform on, and you're a private or corporate or even, you know, like that, and, and a colonel walks by, what do you do? Right? Am I, am I close to being right? Uh, not in the way the salute looks, but you know what I mean? So you get programmed pretty much that way. He said the strangest thing was when he mustered out, he was cleaning out his locker, got everything out. He had his civvies on. He had a couple of suitcases and bags in his head. He's walking down the, the sidewalk, and a colonel comes walking by. He drops the bag. He snaps to attention. He slaps a salute. The colonel looks at him, and then he gets to thinking, wait a minute, I'm a civilian. I don't have to salute. Arm down. Body slouch. Listen, when sin raises its ugly head, when temptation comes to your door, don't stand up and salute it. You've been set free. Look it in the eye and surrender to God. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Life lived under grace is a victorious life. Make a choice. Break from the old life. Embrace the new. As we close, I'd simply ask you, is there, I don't know, is there anybody here that Oh, you so desperately need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to see that old sin nature dead and buried. And you need that new life that only Christ can give. Can I tell you in a moment, I'm going to invite you to join me down here. Let me show you how easy it is to go from death to life, from bondage to freedom. If you're ready to give it up to Jesus. Maybe you're here in a believer and, and you've had more defeat in your life than you had victory and you, you struggle and you don't even want victory. God's giving you some secrets. Join me down here. And we'll pray. And God will further reveal to you the steps to victory. What's God saying? What's he saying to your life today? And how are you going to respond? Father, thank you. I thank you for grace, for mercy. I thank you for your great goodness. I thank you, Lord, that you paid it all. You did it all. All I have to do is give myself up to you. Oh, glorious is our God. Lord, I pray for those who do not know you. Maybe they're listening online and they don't know you. They're struggling with that decision today, Lord. Make this the first day of their whole new life. As they give their heart and life to you. Those here that may need to know you, Lord, bring them. Open our eyes and understanding to truth. And we know, Lord, that you are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. And we know that the only way to you is to be in you. Oh, God.
God, thank you. Bless now these moments as we sing. Do in our heart and life what you've purposed to do, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we sing? I'm going to invite you. I'm going to be right here. Do you need that relationship? Or would you come to Christ today? You need victory in your life. Would you come today? You need a home, a church. God, lead me here. What's he saying to you as we sing? I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. And I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me. Because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You oh, yeah. are my king. What's God saying? Jesus, you are my king. Jesus, you. Jesus, you are my King. Amazing love, how can it be? You knew my King would die for me. 
Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's a joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do. So thank you for worship, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Mike, Daniel, get up here. I know when you came up, you didn't know. I, I had just, just then had finished praying for you. Michael, what did you do as we knelt here? You may not have heard that. He said, I gave myself up to Jesus. Amen. We're seeing whole families, folks. It's a happy mama back there, by the way. <laughs> happy brother. Happy old man. That's me. You going to follow God in obedience baptism? Yeah. All right. Woo. <laughs> Are you all happy with that? Amen. Yeah, I was hoping somebody would say amen and give a shout out or a clap. <laughs> Knelt at that floor dead, stood up alive forevermore. Thank you, God. Thank you. Now, y'all can come stand with him if you want to, but he's part of your family, folks. Come love on him. He's a brand new child in God. Father, I want to thank you so much for your presence here today. Thank you for Linda. Thank you for Emmanuel. To you be glory, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. You're all invited to potluck. We got plenty food. And by the way, I moved this down here. We're, we're inching in. I know there's over, we have over 3,000. I, I know some came in today, but you know, we're getting very close because we got to get this system upgraded so we don't keep having some of the glitches that we've been having. So you pray and it'll all get taken care of. That's all we're asking you to do. May God bless you. Sing us out. Y'all come love on Michael here. Let him know you love him as we sing our way out. Oh, by the way, back here is Joseph. Everybody say, hey, Joseph, congratulations. Hey, congratulations. The graduate. All right, Woo. God bless. Let's sing. Have a good week. You're dismissed. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Where streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, when I found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise when the darkness closes in lord still i will say blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be your glorious name Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's as as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked 
with suffering, there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you poured out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. The heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious Thank you.